uh, and specifically for coming to Professor Nagel's talk today. <clears throat> Before we get started, I just wanted to say a few words um, uh, related to today's pre uh, presentation. Uh, the first is uh, to let you know that the university has launched um, what we're referring to as the Chicago Science Initiative. And the Chicago Science Initiative has six key components, uh, which are molecular engineering, genomics and systems biology, neuroscience, astronomy and astrophysics, uh, computation, and then a new facilities project for physical and computation science. Uh, to give you a sense of the enthusiasm behind this so far, uh, this initiative um, has been in the works for just over uh, a year right now. <coughs> and we have raised $42.2 million in favor of Chicago Science. And we actually much. have $3.8 million in goods that are uh, uh, being negotiated right now. We simply haven't uh, signed the paperwork on it yet. So that will happen this month, bringing us to $46 million for Chicago Science. And uh, in that, and specifically for our molecular engineering program, uh, we have closed a gift of $10 million from the Pritzker family through Mr. Tom Pritzker, and so we're very excited about that. Um, I just wanted to whet your appetite a little bit with that. Um, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity to talk more about that later. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, uh, my name is Roger Triple, uh, and uh, I'll introduce a few other people in a moment. <coughs> But um, you can feel free to ask us questions later. Uh, segue to later, um, immediately following this presentation, right across the street at the Gordon Center, uh, and specifically in the Kirsten Audit uh, Atrium at the Gordon Center, there's going to be a reception uh, where you can have uh, more of an opportunity to speak directly with Professor Nagel. And we also have our <coughs> mathematician and PhD uh, Dean Bob Fefferman here at the um, University of Reception, and you can speak with him uh, at that time as well. <coughs> and so, Professor Nagel. <coughs> um, Sidney Nagel is the Stein Freiler Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Physics, the James Frank Institute, the Enrico Fermi Institute, and the College here at the University of Chicago. After earning his BA from Columbia and his PhD from Princeton, Professor Nagel joined the Chicago faculty in 1976. His honors include the American Physical Society's Oliver Buckley Prize in 1999 and election to the National Academy of Sciences in 2003. <clears throat> Much of Professor Nagel's work has drawn attention to the phenomena that scientists generally have regarded as outside the realm of physics. This includes the science of drops, granular materials, and jamming. He also focused, he's also focused on understanding the properties of disordered materials. All of this interest in disordered systems has made him an innovative researcher and a fascinating teacher. In 1996, he won the Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. An article written at that time describes his office as being full of physics gadgets, such as slinkies, spinning tops, and liquid crystals that change color with the heat of your hand. Professor Nagel often tackles complex physics problems embedded in what appear to be ordinary, ubiquitous, and well-understood phenomena, like coffee spins. <clears throat> Please join me in welcoming Professor Sidney Nagel. Well, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you all back to the university. I hope you're all having a great time here uh, today, tomorrow, as long as you can stay. Um, what I'd like to uh, tell you about is some of the work that we've been doing, and I've given it the somewhat... Uh, um, contentious title, Postmodern Life and uh, Death of a Drop. And uh, I want to go into the various aspects of this as I go through this talk. What it really is going to be is a photographic exploration of our world, and I call it our singular world because I'm going to be talking about certain kinds of singularities that occur in, in ubiquitously around, around you. Um, and then I want to, the part having to do with uh, postmodernism, is I want to kind of point out certain kind of cultural similarities between the sciences and the humanities that are kind of embodied in the kind of stuff that I'm going to be telling you about today. 
So the goal of this talk is going to be to, first of all, and most importantly, I guess, explain some of the science behind the photographs that I'm going to show you. And so uh, there's not going to be very much data, but I assure you there is data, and I could plot, make many, many plots for you, which would bore you silly about what the data is that we've got. But I'm going to really be showing you uh, the, the photographs on which a lot of this data is based. Uh, and I want, in doing so, I want to tell you about the science, but I also want to kind of demonstrate the elegance or beauty of the phenomena themselves. And so that's very important to me, as you'll see. So my contention is that there are different, but they're also equally valid modes of appreciation that allow you to look at what's happening in nature. And that just looking at one or the other, just the science or just the art aspects of it, you're going to be missing something. And so bringing them both together uh, is something which I think uh, is often neglected, but I, my contention is that it's, it really gives you a much deeper and richer view of life. And uh, it's obvious to me, but uh, unfortunately, not all my colleagues agree with this, and so this is going to be my particular view of this. And then, as I said, indicate some uh, of the similarities to uh, postmodernism. So let me start off by... Uh, going to the title of the talk, which is uh, The Life and Death of a Drop. And that's really what I'm going to be telling you about throughout this talk. And I'm going to be uh, mentioning different aspects of it. During the brief existence of a drop, it goes through many different stages. And so those are the stages I want to, uh, to talk about, and particularly how those stages come about and what happens as you go through those different stages. And so. This is going to be, you know, telling you about the life and death of a drop, but I also hope you'll see that, you know, this really extends to a much broader class of phenomena, that this is a test bed for understanding many different kinds of things. And so let me give you the example of, of where I'm going to start, which is this drop, which is this simple sketch hanging here. It's a drop that I've just drawn. It's a whole, being, you know, Dropping from uh, the, the roof of this building, it's, as it starts off, it's all connected in one uh, piece. As time goes on, it gets heavier and it starts to fall. As it falls, the, it forms a neck between the fluid up here and the fluid down there. And uh, it, this region in this neck gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And at some point, finally, the two edges of this drop come together and the drop disconnects between the fluid down below and the fluid up on top. So one of the things that you should see here is, well, something really dramatic has happened here. There's a real transition that's taken place. Initially, all of this liquid is connected to one another. It had one topology. An instant later, there were two separate pieces of fluid. So the, the topology has changed. So there's a real change in the topology. That's one aspect of this. But what I'm most concerned about is what happens during this transition. How does that transition take place? And so if you think about this, the way I've described this in this naive picture, which uh, I want you to see, is, uh, I'm going to emphasize this naive picture, and you'll see real pictures of this, and you'll see it doesn't really look this way, but this picture is good enough for us to see what the physics is, or what the question is. So, I was telling you that I have this neck that's connecting the fluid up above and the fluid below. In order for this fluid to break apart, this neck has to get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until it breaks apart, until the radius of that neck goes to zero. If it didn't go to zero, well, then it wouldn't have broken apart, right? It would have still been connected. So this neck has to shrink to zero radius in this direction, right? So. It's coming together and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, what happens during that? Well, there's one aspect of fluids that I'm going to assert now, and uh, it's something you're kind of familiar with, is that fluids have this thing called surface tension. And surface tension is why a drop wants to be in a sphere, if possible. That is, a raindrop isn't going to be all uh, funny shaped, it's going to try and bring itself into a sphere because it doesn't like to have uh, much surface area. Surface area costs it energy. So it's going to try and minimize this area, and that means that there's a pressure difference between the inside and the outside of this drop, which is proportional to the, this quantity that I've just mentioned, the surface tension, times the curvature of the drop. Well, what is the curvature? The curvature is 
1 over the radius of this thing. So as the radius shrinks, the curvature, so radius r goes to 0, 1 over the radius is going to infinity. So what I'm having at just at the instant of breaking off where this radius has gone to 0, the curvature has gotten infinitely large. It means I have an infinitely large pressure difference between the inside and the outside of this drop at that point. So this is a problem for us. So if we were going to try and do a simulation of this, as we know what the equations of motion are, that's not the, the issue here. So we have this, uh, this drop. We're going to put it on a computer. We're going to simulate this. Well, at the beginning, we've got this big drop down here. We have to get that right. And then we also have to get this neck right. So we do a simulation. And then we want to get a little closer to the breakup point. So we work harder. We have to get more points in this region where it's getting really small. So we get that finer and finer. We work harder. We get closer to the point of breakup. We want to get closer. So we work harder still, and harder still, and harder still. And it's just like Zeno's paradox. Right? No matter how hard I work, I don't get to the other side of the breakup event. I only can get close to the breakup event. I can't get to the other side. And so what we have is um, um, you know, computers all over the world which are trying to simulate this thing. And they've got these drops hanging there all over the place trying to figure out how to break apart. And you know, nature doesn't have that problem. I mean, the drops just come off, and they don't worry about how this is happening. So this is, what this means is that nature understands something that we as physicists don't understand, or as mathematicians we don't understand. And so this is the issue that we want to raise. How do we understand this breakup event so we can do a simulation and get to the other side? After all, that's what we need to do if we're going to understand many, many processes in the world. So, that's the idea. Can we have an understanding of this kind of a transition? Now, I promise I would tell you that this isn't just what happens at the scale of um, you know, the, the drop. So uh, here is a, an example that was uh, probably the most famous picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is these gas clouds in the Eagle Nebula. And this is where star formation takes place. Well, how does star formation take place out of this? What happens is that the gas collapses. These big columns have to break up into little bits of pe different pieces. And in order for that to happen, the same kind of picture that I just drew for the water drop is going to have to happen here. That is, this neck has to shrink and separate into two. And if we're going to be able to understand that and, and simulate this and get to the other side of the breakup so we can begin to understand star formation, we have to understand that same question that I just told you uh, for the drop case. On a smaller scale, these are some pictures under the microscope from Alina Boudrin's lab at Harvard of some bacteria colonies. The bacteria colonies form into, you know, they communicate with each other, they do complicated things, but they like to form structures. So here is a structure. This white thing is one band of the bacteria that's sitting there. A little bit later, it breaks into two. Well, the way this breaks into two is just exactly the same kind of question that I told you about for the drops and for those star-forming regions. So we have seen this breakup type of event where the singularity is in between these two different regimes at the celestial scale, at the you know, uh, room size scale, uh, you know, uh, what you can see with your eyes, to the microscopic scale. If you think further, well, you can go down and think about nuclear fission. It's the same thing where the nucleus is considered to be a liquid drop, and that also breaks apart. And the physics of that has got to involve the same kind of singularities that I'm talking about here. So you see this on all different scales, this particular problem. And so the idea of singularities that appear in other kinds of things will also spread throughout all of uh, the different re regimes of physics. So that's the issue. So what uh, I want to say is, well, actually, who did the work in our lab that I'm going to be telling you about? And the thing that I really uh, want to emphasize here is that this is a truly a Chicago type of thing that is it's a collaboration between experimentalists, my group, which is an experimental group, and a lot of different theorists that we have around. And the heroine of this story from the theoretical side is Wendy Zhang. And so, uh, a lot of the ideas I'm going to tell you are coming from her. Now, I'm going to give you 
the experimental perspective because that's what I do. And but you shouldn't. You should really understand that the any progress that we've made has really come because there's this collaboration between theory and experiment throughout. And so that's that's crucial to to understand. Okay, so this is the life and death of a drop, and so this is the birth. And it's a happy childhood. Right? And all happy childhoods are the same. And uh, here is a drop. And by looking at this drop, you really don't know what kind of fluid this is. It, any, any fluid would have done this. It's just sitting there. It's just about ready to go. And why is it so ubiquitous? Why does everything look the same? Is well, it's not moving yet. Basically, it's just sitting there. It's, it's, we caught this just after it started to move a little bit. Okay, so that means that the dynamics inside the drop aren't important yet. So it's really just a balance of gravity pulling this thing down and surface tension, uh, which is uh, trying to hold this thing together to, to, to keep it in. The, you know, it doesn't want to stretch out to the surface tension. So what I want to ask now is, well, how does this drop start to break apart? And so the question I want to ask is, well, suppose I had a cylinder of fluid. Will that cylinder be stable? Or will it want to do something else? Well, you know the answer already that I, I've been telling you that it wants to curl up into a ball. And so that, of course, would happen. But I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to hold the cylinder at these two ends so it can't move in this way. That's going to be held out like that. And now the question is, well, is that cylinder now going to be stable if I don't let it move in this way? And the, it, it's a simple calculus question of just asking, well, is the surface area larger or smaller when I have this cylinder than a small variation from that cylinder? And so the small variation that's typically considered in this case is, and I've tried to draw it here, but if that isn't clear, let me just say that I had a cylinder which was the same radius everywhere. And now what I want to do is I'm going to just have a small sinusoidal variation in the radius of this cylinder. So it's a little bit thicker at the ends, a little thinner in the middle, thicker at the ends again. Okay, so that's what I've drawn here. And the answer is that this has less surface area than this if it's long enough. In particular, if this length is greater than this original circumference. So that's just a, a mathematical fact. And that mathematical fact is very important because it says that this cylinder will start to break up. Any small perturbation will certainly start making this go, and it'll be happier this way than that way. And so this will grow on itself, and it'll feed on itself, and that will tr try to break up. So this is what's called the Rayleigh plateau instability. Uh, and you've seen it many times. And you can see it right now. So I'm going to ask you to take your uh, thumb and finger and stick in your mouth and get really uh, stuff on it. OK, so uh, I expected a lot of you would be very shy. And, uh, and you are. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, this evening, go back to your hotel room or your home when no one can see you. Close the bathroom door, lock it so no one can go in. And when you've done that, then stick your fingers in your mouth and do this experiment. And so you pull your fingers apart just a little bit, and you'll see a little thread of fluid between your fingers and if you wait just the right point, you'll see that this thing starts to form little bulges along that, along that cylinder. Okay, so you have to uh, you know, do, do it fairly carefully, but then you get to see this. Now, since I knew you wouldn't all want to do this, I've taken a picture of what, you know, what you're supposed to see. And this is uh, the, uh, what, uh, the kind of thing that you see. Well, kind of. OK, and so what is this? So this is uh, probably this is the best part of the talk. I mean, you know, this is a bolus spider. It's a, it's a great little insect. Well, not insect, uh, arachnid, whatever. Uh, it's a spider. Uh, and uh, what it does, it doesn't build its web. But what it does is it secretes that stuff down and forms this ball at the bottom connected by this thread. And when the fly comes around, it winds it up, gets it, and then it does what spiders typically do to flies. Well, all of this was the excuse I have to show you this, uh, uh, this picture, which is if you look along this thread of liquid connecting the 
the spider's leg to the drop, you'll see that it's this long, thin thread with lots of globby stuff up and down, all up and down. That's the same kind of thing, where it's just breaking up into these little drops of the same kind as I was uh, showing you before that you would have seen in this case. You've probably also seen it when you go out in the uh, nice spring morning and there's dew on the ground and you see a spider's web and all along the spider's web you see these little globules of water that have just beat it up and they beat up in the same way from this Rayleigh instability. Okay, so this was the childhood of the, uh, of the drop, but of course now you get to the midlife crisis. And what are you going to do at the midlife crisis? And so in this case, the midlife crisis for the drop is where it starts to break apart. Okay, and now uh, it goes berserk. So I've taken two pictures here of this breakup event. And what you see is, first of all, this breakup event doesn't look like that smooth variation I showed you at the beginning. What this looks like is a cone pointing into the sphere down below. Okay. And these two look the same. I can't tell, really tell the difference between them. But I've hid the rest of the drop from you, so I just want you to see what it is that I was taking a picture of. And so these are the pictures that I, was, I just uncovered. So this is a normal drop. This drop I turned upside down, and it really was this picture. And so I'm showing you this and that part up there. I just turned it upside down. And the point of this was, in this case, gravity is pointing down. But here, it's pointing in the direction of this cone. In this case here, it was pointing opposite to the direction of the cone, but they looked virtually identical. So this is saying that there's something very universal about the way this drop is breaking apart. It's the same thing from drop to drop. And from even though the gravity is pointing in opposite directions in this case, one is in the direction of the cone, the other is the opposite, it still manages to only look like this cone pointing into the sphere at the end. Okay, so this is indicating that there's something kind of universal going on in this case. So what I want to show you now is a movie of this drop breaking part. It's just an ordinary water drop. But I, I need to tell you a couple of things about this movie before you see it. The first thing is that you know, this was taken back before we had a new lab and so forth. And so it was a very decrepit lab, terrible. And it was so bad and so old that gravity went sideways. OK. <laughs> and so uh, you're going to see the drop go from this side of the screen over to that side of the screen. And the reason, of course, was that we turned the camera on its side so that you could get the long aspect ratio. But gravity is really, in this movie, going in this direction. The second thing was that this is uh, taken at 10,000 frames a second, being shown back at around 30 frames a second. And so uh, it's, uh, it's slowed down by a few hundred. So let's see if I can get this to go. Okay, so here is the drop of water. This is about a centimeter up here. And it's being pulled down on that side. In a little bit, you'll see this neck forming, forming the cone into the sphere right around there. Then you get this beautiful set of uh, pearls, string of pearls. Those in the front row could have even seen a little piece of liquid that shot off backwards. So I mean, there's a lot going on here. It shows that breakup event. But this is the other part of what I want you to see is that this is really, uh, at least to me, an amazing phenomena. I mean, that nature does something so beautiful every single time a drop breaks apart. Okay, so what you should remember is, OK, you can go back to your hotel rooms tonight or wherever, and the, it's going to be dripping in the bathroom sink, and it's going to keep you awake at night. right? Just remember, this is what's happening each time, and you'll feel much better about the whole, uh, <laughs> uh, the whole process. Yeah. OK, so what I want to now talk about is uh, how should we think about this breakup event? And so this is the one real science idea I want to try and get across to you, because it's kind of a powerful idea. And I think you know, I, I can say it in words that make it uh, palatable. Okay, so, how are we supposed to think about this breakup event? Well, you know, I've been telling you over and over again that this neck is shrinking to zero radius. Right? That was the whole point of this. Over and over again, it's just shrinking to zero radius. I've said that many times so far. Okay. 
So what does that mean? That means that the radius of this neck is eventually getting smaller than any other length in the problem. I don't mean the atomic scale because uh, this, I'm still thinking about this thing as a continuum fluid. It's, it's this fluid that, that we're looking at, this, this liquid. But it's getting smaller than any of the length scales that, is, that are associated with that fluid by arbitrarily amount, uh, large amounts because uh, it's, it, this is actually going to zero. So if that radius is going to zero, what is the flow like in that radius? What can it depend on? And the question is, can it depend on any of those other length scales? And the idea is, no, it, it can't really depend on those length scales. That, and so what, the idea is that it can only depend on the radius of that neck itself. Now, why would you think of something like that? What, why is that at all reasonable? So I'm going to ask you to think about water, rain, water coming onto a big mountainside. Okay, the, the, it falls on the mountains. It collects in these mighty rivers that go across the continent. They end up in a, a, a delta where the river breaks up into smaller brooks, rivulets, streams. And then finally, the water flows between two little pebbles in the stream. And my question to you is, the dynamics of how that water is flowing through those two little pebbles, does it matter that the water originally came from the mountainside? And the answer is, uh, well, obviously, no. I mean, it, c it couldn't. I mean, that's so far away. I mean, it doesn't matter anymore. Well, that's a guess. We're going to have to check that guess, right? I mean, that's not uh, necessarily the obvious thing to have thought. But what do you, I've said in those words, it kind of becomes clear that, that it shouldn't depend anymore. So the flow only depends on that shrinking radius. That's the, that was the statement I just made. That is, because the other length scales are so far away in in size from that neck itself. So, but what does the radius depend on? The flow depended on the radius, but the radius actually was formed by the stuff flowing through it. So, the radius depends on the flow. But it depends on the radius, which depends on the flow, radius, flow, radius, flow, radius, all the way down. Okay? So, what have I constructed here? I've constructed for you a fractal sentence. That is, I take any part of the sentence, and I blow it back up, and I get the original sentence back. So this is the essence of what's happening in the mathematics here. That is, is this self-similar behavior in the mathematics on different scales? And the idea is that you blow up any part of that drop breaking apart near, near the, the breakup event, and you'll gain the original back in, in some particular form. And so this is why you get this kind of universal shapes. It doesn't depend on very much anymore. It just depends on this, uh, this one aspect of the dynamics. So let me show you, I mean, I, I did promise you know, that we do have data for all of the stuff that I'm telling you about. And so I'm showing you one piece of data. This is uh, one of the drops that we uh, took a picture of. This is the one that this data is for. This is for a highly viscous fluid inside another fluid of equally large viscosity. So this is glycerol and this is an oil that's falling through. And you see the way this one breaks apart. And the idea, the mathematics behind this is saying if I have the drop in the process of breaking off at one point and I want to get closer to the point where it breaks off, what I do is I just take that neck and I multiply it by something in this direction and something else perhaps in that direction and I get at a point closer to the breakup event. If I want to get closer still, I do that process again and again and again and again. And that's, in that sense, it's this, that's the way in which this thing is a self-similar behavior. And this data is supposed to show you that. This is data taken at different points during the breakup event. Uh, this is the axial direction. This is the radial direction. And I've just scaled them by different amounts at different times. And you can see that as time gets close to the breakup event, you get this collapse of all the data onto a single curve. And so that's the, the nature of that uh, solution that I was telling you. That, that was the import of that idea about the rain falling on the mountainside. OK, so all happy childhoods are the same. All unhappy drops are unhappy in their own way. Right? And so uh, here we uh, are. And so this is now this picture that uh, of I have four different drops. They are 
this is water falling air. This is a water and glycerol mixture falling air, so it's more viscous than, than water. This is something a thousand times more viscous than water falling in that oil that was a thousand times more viscous than water. And this now is pure water falling inside a very, very high uh, viscous fluid. And you see that each one of these looks incredibly different from the one before it. They're all looking very differently. And so what this is saying is that there are different regimes for the breakup process. And we, as experimentalists, that's our job, is to try and figure out what's happening in these different regimes and classify the different regimes in the same way that people have long time tried to classify different kinds of phenomena happening in, uh, uh, in, in phase transitions. So the way we look at this is we explore different regimes because we can vary the viscosity of the fluid. We can vary the viscosity of the outer fluid or the ratio of these two viscosities. We can vary the density of the fluid, the density of the out, outer fluid, so we can vary those. We can vary the surface tension that I've told you so much about. We can vary the nozzle diameter. These are the tools at the experimentalists that can call that I get to control to figure out which regime I want to be in. And that's, the, uh, and, and that's how we go about this. So what, was, what have I been telling you? Well, I've been telling you about this role of scale and variance in the problem. That is, that's this idea of this, this drop in the process of breaking apart becomes like itself over and over again, ever so much more so as you get to the point of breakup. And that means that these singularities that I was so worried about at the beginning, this was the issue that we didn't know how to treat. Once we have this guess of how, this is how the dynamics takes place, and which we can show in that one case is actually the way it really does take place, well, it's insensitive to all the other lengths, and it makes the problem a lot easier to solve, and we can actually solve this. Okay? It emphasizes what's universal. But, of course, we were fools, and we did one experiment too many. Right? And so the, what the experiment was, was remember this picture. This is a picture of the water drop falling in air. So what happens if I reverse the process? That is, I have a... Uh, airdrop falling in water. That is, that's a bubble rising, right? It's the exact, it's just reversing everything. That is, what was on the inside before was water, air on the outside. Now I've just reversed them. The air is on the inside, water on the outside. It's rising instead of falling, and it's going to break away. And so this is the picture which is very, uh, uh, you know, we took a lot of care to get this movie that I'm going to, to show you. This is a uh, uh, a very circular nozzle uh, down here, carefully leveled. This is the air bubble coming up. You see it's white in the, in the middle. That's, not, that's just an optical artifact. That's because we've lit this from in back so that we can see the, uh, uh, see the outline. And so it acts a little bit like a lens, so you see uh, the, the white right in, in, in the middle of the drop. But it's not like the drop has a hole in it. It's, that's just how it was lit. So this is how that breakup event takes place. You can see it rise. It's going to break away. This one's going to remain smooth from top to bottom, in this case. And notice it left a little drop coming up. It can hit the top. Bang. It hits off, reflects off the top and comes back down again. So at this stage, this looks kind of like it could have been on the same class of phenomena I was just telling you about. But I was emphasizing how carefully we did this experiment, right? That is, we set it up so that it was level, circular, all of this. What happens if we don't do it quite that carefully? And, of course, the first time we did it, we didn't do it quite that carefully, which is a good lesson. Never do anything too carefully at the beginning. I mean, uh, you, you'll miss a lot of, of good things. So the idea here is suppose you just tilt the nozzle by a tiny little bit, a couple of degrees. Now what you see is that as this drop goes through the breakup event, it no longer retains that symmetry. It doesn't revert back to that symmetric behavior anymore, but it remembers the fact that it was tilted throughout the entire breakup process. So 
Another way of looking at this is to, instead of taking that circular nozzle, suppose I take a slot nozzle, an oblong slot, and I let the, uh, the air escape from that. And then what does the breakup part look like? And so I'm only focusing here right on the, on the region where it's going to be collapsing. Okay? So let's see what that looks like, what, re what remains of that uh, simple picture I was telling you. So this doesn't look like anything I've ever seen. I mean, this thing looks like it was torn apart. And uh, I mean, let me try and see if I can stop this at the right place. OK, so uh, there's one frame too late. But uh, you can see this is, looks like it was torn, like a sheet of paper torn from side to side. And I remind you, this is water and air. That's all it is. I mean, there are two th no two things less likely to tear than water and air. And yet, this is what this thing looks like. So this, is, uh, this was the start of a large research project, understanding this and realizing that the type of phenomena that I was telling you about, this breakup event, we started off with a simple picture that it was going to be like this water falling the mountainside and coming down to the, uh, to the uh, the pebbles in the stream eventually, and it wouldn't care about the initial conditions anymore. Well, that's true in some cases, but now what we found is that there's a whole class of phenomena where that doesn't work anymore. That it does care about all the details of those initial conditions all the way through this breakup event. And that makes us a very different kind of phenomena than we had started to, when, when we started off on this process. So, so this was a big surprise to, to all of us when, when we found this. So, this is, uh, you know, I said we just got through the midlife crisis. And what happens after a midlife crisis? Well, you're in free fall, right? I mean, you have no idea what's going to happen. You're just, uh, what, what, what happens now, OK? And so what's going to happen to this drop in after free fall is it's going to come down and finally, bam, it's going to hit a surface. And then if it hits hard enough, well, it's going to splash, right? That's what drops do when they hit surfaces. And that's what it should do. Okay, so the question that we want to ask was, well, how does it break apart? Okay, so what, how does this splash take place? So this is a picture of uh, what's called a coronal splash. It's a drop hitting a smooth, flat microscope slide. So you see its reflection in, in this mirror. That's what this thing down here is. That you see the reflection of the drop in the microscope slide that, that we're but what you see is it sends out this thin sheet corona, which rises, and then that corona breaks up into lots of little drops. Okay, well, um, you, know, you probably have seen similar pictures of these Edgerton pictures of a drop falling into a thin bit of milk. Uh, and those are a drop <coughs> falling into a liquid. This is different. This is a drop hitting a dry surface. And so this is really a, a very different kind of uh, picture than that, in that sense. But it has certain similarities. OK, so again, I want to show you what this looks like in, as a movie. OK, so this is the drop. It's a drop of alcohol. It's about three and a half millimeters in diameter. It's falling from about a meter. And so it's going to hit the plate at the bottom. Here, this gray thing is the microscope slide here at a, a few meters per second. And uh, you're going to see its reflection as it comes down here. And basically, that's, that's all I need to tell you. And so here it goes. So it's another one of these phenomena which I say it's worth getting up in the morning to come to work. I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is really quite uh, elegant. It's so elegant that I'm going to show it to you again, to, that you get to, to see this, because I think this is really uh, a nice, uh, nice phenomenon. So here is the drop falling. Hits, it spreads <coughs> out. It forms that corona, and the corona then breaks up, and that's what the splash is. So what does this splash depend on? Well, you know, obviously it depends on how big that drop was, uh, and it depends on how fast it was going, and it depends on, oh, that surface tension I've been telling you about that, that holds it together. 
and it depends on what the viscosity of that fluid is. I mean, does it want to move easily or not? It depends on the surface. Is it a dry surface, a wet surface, smooth, rough, all of those things? And that's about it. That's what we would think. Right? It certainly doesn't depend on the air around it. I mean, air doesn't exist. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, I can't even feel it. I mean, it's not there. It's a thousand times less dense than the liquid, a thousand times less dense than the surface. So we obviously can't have any particular influence on this. But you might say, OK, but look, it's got, uh, little drops falling through air feel a drag on this. And if they feel a drag, uh, then the, um, uh, they'll be held back a bit. And so air, there can be a little bit of air resistance in this. And so if there's air resistance, then uh, that's holding this, this from being a really good splash. I mean, I might, so the idea is, suppose I take this and I make a, uh, a you know, get rid of the air around it, then I could get a really excellent splash. Okay, that's, that's the idea. So here is the, what we've done. So here is, again, for the third time, this is this drop of alcohol hitting this plate. A beautiful splash, but it's not big enough. We want something really bigger. So now I'm going to do exactly the same uh, experiment, just essentially at the top of Mount Everest. That is, it's uh, got the pressure at the top of Mount Everest. We're still here in Chicago, but we just sucked out two thirds of the of the air around it, and and uh, so it's a lower pressure, but that's it. So now let's see what this big splash is going to look like. So, in the words of I.I. Robbie, uh, who ordered that? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, this just blew us away. We had no idea that something like this was going to happen. This was just not what we uh, expected at all. I mean, as I told you, it shouldn't happen. And there are other reasons why it shouldn't happen. I mean, uh, these are only the beginning of the reasons why this was a stupid experiment. Right? And, uh, and, and yet, this is something that we, you know, and I should just emphasize, I mean, People have been taking photographs of drops splashing since 1900. Worthington, I mean, I, I just find it amazing. Photography was around 50 years old. They had lousy chemistry and so forth at that point, right? It wasn't really the perfected stuff we have today. He was taking pictures of splashing 100 years ago. And in 100 years, no one had thought to take the air out. Okay. So, and not only is it important, it's actually the control parameter for this problem. Okay. So um, what I, you know, I'm, um, again, so we've studied this in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, I'm not going to tell you all about those. But uh, what I want to uh, ask is, OK, so you saw that that splash, when that occurred, that happened immediately. That is, as soon as this thing hit the, uh, hit the plate, it started to rise up and give rise to, to splashing. What happens when we go to this more viscous fluid? Well, when I go to the more viscous fluid, does, it, does air still matter? And what does the splash look like? So um, here is a, a fluid, basically the same as what I did before. It's just 10, ten times more viscous than, uh, than the alcohol that I showed you. And so this is the, um, what it looks like when it hits the uh, plate. Hits. OK, so is this going to splash? Nah, right? I mean, it, it looks like it's not going to splash to me. So let's continue on and see what happens. OK, so I mean, again, nature is just playing with us. <laughs> I mean, uh, there isn't anything about this that I've predicted right. And then, well, since this obviously happened much later in time, of course, air shouldn't matter anymore. So here is what happens at lower pressure. And it doesn't splash again. So air still is the control parameter, even though the splash is obviously a very different kind of beast. 
So, I mean, it's, there's something really fundamental about the way in which air is coming into this, to this problem. Okay, so you might have thought that was the end, that was the, the death of the drop. But, you know, it isn't really over until all memory of the person is gone, right? And so the same is true for the case of uh, the drop. That is, it, the death isn't over until we, there's no longer any trace of, of the drop left. And so this raises the question, well, once that drop hits the plate, what remains after a while? Well, it's a stain that's left by the fluid. And so, for example, if I had a coffee stain hitting a, uh, on a platform, it would just be a simple, smooth drop sitting here, a, kind of a, a circular cap on this drop. And it's filled with coffee everywhere. And so after it dries, well, clearly, I would have thought that the most of the stain will be at the center of this drop and very little around the edge. I mean, that's what sense reason. I mean, there's mo that's where most of the coffee was to begin with. And so, of course, sitting at home, I'm just sitting there drinking my coffee in the morning, every morning, making more and more coffee stains everywhere. And suddenly I realize, well, you know, there isn't one of them that looks that way. All the coffee stains that I know are darker around the edge and lighter in the center. So I've taken, for those of you who don't, you know, uh, remember this, I mean, I've taken the pictures of some coffee stains. So here are some <laughs> coffee stains for you. I mean, so here I put uh, four together, and you can see it's light in the center with a dark rim around each of the four. Here I pulled out little things, so they, uh, little tadpoles, and so again, it's all around the outside, particularly dark in the, in the tails. Here was a, um, a, a big blob, and it was featureless, ugly, nothing there. So I just took a straw, and I pulled out little tendrils. I couldn't see them at the beginning. But as time went on, you saw when it dried, all of the stain actually collected out in the outermost parts of this. So this is something that's very ubiquitous. It happens all the time. And so you know, if is this an important question, or is it only of interest to a few diehard coffee drinkers like myself? And the answer is, well, you know, it actually happens everywhere, on everything, that is, or essentially everything. So you paint your garage, and you have a little bit of a, a dimple left because you didn't paint that, uh, paint that out. It's a little drop, and it doesn't look so bad. But if you leave it dry, what you find at the end is it's got that little dimple in the center. It's that donut shape, and that looks kind of ugly, right? At, the end. So that really looks bad. And so that's the same thing. The stuff is trying to move as much as it can to the outside edges of this thing. So these are some pictures, but what I was really pleased about was that you know, we're going to make a real bundle, a killing on this, because we invented the coffee stain font. And so we wrote the words <laughs> coffee stain in coffee stain. And you know, it's really a beautiful font at the end. If you look at this, I mean, it's, every letter is outlined beautifully. The outside parts where there's a lot of curvature are particularly dark, where uh, it's inside, the, uh, the, there's less coffee buildup. It's really quite an elegant thing. And, you know, if they could only you know, figure out a way why they might need this, we might actually be able to use it. But, so this is the picture of, uh, you know, of where this comes from, and, and you know, as I say, it's a very ubiquitous phenomenon. It happens all around us. And then you ask, well, where does this come from, and why is it so ubiquitous? And this again was done by uh, one of our undergraduates. And so this was the key experiment was done by her of her idea of um, how uh, how to start thinking about this. And I mean, it's really quite shameful how long it it took us to figure this out. And the reason it took us to uh, so long was because it was so robust, we couldn't make it go away. So everyone had a different theory for this, but unless you're able to make this thing go away so you can control it, you don't have no way of testing these different models for what's going on. And so th this was her, uh, her, her idea for this. But at the end, again, it was a, a collaboration with um, one of Bob's colleagues, Todd DuPont from uh, Math Department Computer Science, which uh, made this, uh, brought us over the hump on this. And the idea is very simple, again. And it's so simple that, you know, you should not tell my dean why it took us so long to, to do this, okay? 
so here is the, uh, the, the substrate. This blue is the original drop. And I have to tell you just two things about the evaporation. One is, when it evaporates, the, some fluid leaves, leaving other stuff behind. Well, that's obvious. That's what evaporation is. And the second thing, which is not so obvious, but you can check it on every drop on your kitchen counter this evening, is that this drop is pinned at the two edges. That is, when it evaporates, it doesn't move in like this. It moves down. So that means these points can't move. With just that idea, you can see the following. That is, if I evaporated from this drop a layer all across this drop, I would go from this dark blue to this dashed blue line. But that would have brought this point in. And if it brings that point in, I told you that can't happen. So it really has to go to that red line, which means there has to be a flow to get from the blue to the red line. That's the flow from the inside moving the fluid to the outside rim. Another way of saying this is that any fluid that leaves the edge of this uh, drop has to be replenished by a flow from the inside. So that's another way of saying it. So that's the simple idea of what is giving rise to this. And again, this was not known. I mean, this is uh, what uh, I find fascinating. So th this is, that, that really is the end of the life of the drop. And now I, I promised I was going to say a few words about my contention of what kind of science, where does this fit in with things, and, and you know, f from uh, the science to the uh, humanities on this campus and, and all of that. And so my, my contention is this is a kind of postmodern physics that we're involved in. And I want to now draw parallels between physics and the arts, the, the, culturally, and in the trends and attitudes of modernism versus postmodernism. And so the main thing about postmodernism is it's a reaction against so, the so-called canons of modernity. Okay? And so it's in what one studies and also the techniques that you use to, to study this. So what I need to tell you is, well, what are we reacting against? That is, what is modernity that I can try to react against it? And one of the things that in science that you've probably felt from a lot of lectures and seeing this in newspapers and so forth is that modern physics is uh, what's really important, where you peel back the layers of one layer to get to a deeper layer. And so you start with classical physics, you peel something back, and you get to um, uh, quantum mechanics. And then you peel that back some more, and you get to a deeper level. This is a, really what a lot of science has been about, a lot of what, what physics has been about. And that's what we want to do when we do modern physics. And so what's basically been considered is that the fundamental layers, that is, that's like high culture in the humanities, is better in some sense. That's, it's deeper, it's more profound, it's more important, all of those things, than the less primitive ones, which are somehow like popular culture in, uh, in, in the humanities. I mean, so you know, if you study uh, 17th century poetry, it isn't quite as good as studying 13th century poetry, and it's certainly, but it's certainly a lot better than studying modern poetry. Right? I mean, there's this pecking order that you get throughout all of academia, and it's here too. And so as I was trying to point out, what are the uh, canons that we're, we have in physics? Well, you have classical physics. You peel that back, and you get to you know, quantum mechanics. You get to relativity. These are things that came out of uh, modern physics that helped to explain certain things in modern physics, in, in classical physics. Then these were worked on very hard, and you got the unified theory of weak and electromagnetic interactions. And so that was a big success. And then you're working hard now, and maybe it will come out the string theory or some other theory that unifies all of the forces of nature. And then you would think, well, that's pretty good. So we've gotten down to the most basic level. But what I think about postmodern physics is that, well, what I want to do is I want to reclaim for physics what was abandoned by this approach. That is, what we see around us, all the things, questions I've told you about today are of that kind. They are not things that are leading me 
downwards are leading me in the actually the act opposite direction. And so uh, my contention is, you know, eventually you're going to get to the point where, well, we've got the last theory in, the, in that direction, and then is physics supposed to die? And I don't think so, because I think there's a lot in the other direction that we need to be exploring. And so there is the uh, wonderful uh, rallying cry of Mies van der Rohe that less is more, which I guess he borrowed from Robert Browning. And then there's the follow-up cry from condensed matter physicists, which is saying, well, but more is different. That is, you put more things together, you actually get different kinds of phenomena than you had if you had only had the few original things, so that you can't predict what's going to happen just by looking at the more basic level, that new phenomena, new laws emerge as you go to higher and higher levels of, uh, of, of examining the universe. And what I hope this leads to is, well, once we see all these differences, we'll be able to understand them as all being part of the same kind of thing. So, again, what's important here is, well, there are incongruous elements from the past brought in, and I think you've seen this. I mean, studying a coffee stain is really not quantum mechanics. It's not relativity. It's now, I mean, you don't really need that much to study maybe a microscope, which you could have done in 1700. You didn't need to be in the 21st century to, to study that. Right? So you're not even sure what century this work needed to be in. That's kind of what you see in architecture. Uh, and that you also have this idea of there are multiple significance of things. And this is, again, another idea I've tried to stress over and over today is that, well, there are different ways of looking at this drop breaking apart or the splash. I mean, there's the idea of the platonic forms. That's the physics ideas that I was trying to, to tell you about, that th these are the fundamental things that I want to understand. But then there's another aspect, well, is this useful or not? I mean, suppose I find this out. Will you care? Will it matter to, to people in the general world? I mean, that's something that's certainly worth considering. And then finally, there's this idea of aesthetics. I mean, uh, and that's the part that I was pushing, is that this stuff is amazingly... I mean, I, I hate to use the word beautiful because I use that once and the philosophers just jumped down my throat with that. So, uh, but let's just say aesthetics. It's really, uh, it, it has a different dimension from these other questions. And that's what I think uh, enriches this subject in a way. And, and that's what I, uh, where I would like to draw the parallels. But I should emphasize the following thing, which is often associated with postmodernism, is that the idea of relativity of truth. And that's not what I mean. And I still have the motto that if you go to my lab, you'll see above the door, there's a sign that says experiment where theory comes to die. I mean, it really, uh, that's where it's the experiment where the tire hits the road and where you find out whether you're right or you're wrong in, in all of this. Okay, so now to wax philosophical or poetic in ending this, I mean, there was a, a wonderful... Uh, piece of writing by Wallace Stegner called The Wilderness Letter, where he was arguing why wilderness was important to preserve. And he said, the reminder and the reassurance that it is still there is good for our spiritual health, even if we never once in 10 years set foot in it. It is important to us when we are old, simply because it is there. Important, that is, simply as idea. That's a beautiful statement. And that's what's important to this, uh, for us, to know that it's there and to have seen it and to have that in, in our souls somehow. Well, I find the same is true of these small kind of mundane ob objects I've been telling you about. I mean, I think they're precise and they're elegance. Those things are often ignored about them, but once you've seen their magnific magnificence, uh, they're very difficult to forget. And I hope you've, you'll remember some of that in, from what you've seen today. And these objects make up our everyday world, and it's what gives texture to our lives. And it's important to uh, look into their core to see what contributes to why they behave in that way. <clears throat> and so these things, too, are important simply as idea. And so the idea is the physics, but it's also the image. It's both of these things together, which I think are, are crucial. And so... Victor Hugo said, where the telescope ends, the microscope begins, and which has a wider vision? You may choose. And so I think that's true here. That is, the stuff I've been showing you is with the microscope, looking at small things. We go miles to see uh, 
you know, the great landscapes of our country and the beautiful surroundings, and that's beautiful too, but uh, I'm seduced by these objects at this more modest level. And I think that they have an elegance and beauty all their own, which can rival that of these uh, larger landscapes. So just to finish, I just want to come back to the, where I started, which is this idea of the drops breaking apart and the life and death of a drop. And what I hope I've shown you is that at every stage, this drop arouses astonishment. I mean, I, th I, I think I heard gasps, so I think a number of you were surprised by different things that you saw throughout this, uh, uh, this presentation, things you didn't expect to see. And you know, we've treated this, I didn't tell you too much about this, but that one idea I told you about with the uh, scale invariance, that's uh, an important idea that runs through all of the different pieces that I've, uh, uh, the physics that I've uh, been telling you. And there's a wonderful quotation by the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, which is a great idea, in which case I'm thinking of the scale invariance and the scaling ideas that come from that. A great idea is like a phantom ocean beating upon the shores of human life in successive waves of specialization. And I think that really captures something of what was happening here. There are these ideas that are hallmarks of what physics has been in the last uh, decades, and they come in over and over again in different ways different, uh, to attack different kinds of problems, and we've been lucky enough to, to see them all converge in these different things here. And with that, I'll thank you for thank you. The oblong with the top nozzle, um, water drop, and it tears. Does it tear in any patterns, or or, or is it uh, appear to uh, be a random pattern the tearing? Um, so we can get this thing to be uh, reproducible. That is, if you really start very close to the same conditions. But what it, it does know, I mean, so the. Look, that one is a picture that just shows how bizarre this stuff can really be, get to look like. In, in order to actually study this, this was the, uh, the uh, based on the theoretical stuff that Wendy Zhang uh, has uh, pioneered for us, is that you know if you look at just you, you take a small variation from the circular cross section, so you don't start with that very far thing, but you start close to the symmetry case then you can actually trace how those vibrations from that go on until you get through to the, uh, to the breakup part. And so it, th that's in a very precise way. That is the dynamics. It, what, if you start the thing carefully, uh, we have 17 sets of data that all lie right on top of each other. And so, so if I look at her papers, I would get to see the variations, uh, those stepwise that you just described? Uh, or uh, you, yeah. You, that, uh, this uh, the most recent thing shows that, shows this um, oscillation and watching how that thing uh, breaks apart.